Um, all right. Uh, wonderful to meet all of you. Um, hopefully this will be informative, uh, yet brief. Um, and so I think I, I think y'all are controlling the slides. Um, could you share the first one? All right. Um, and next slide. Um, so I'm going to share three headlines from the, the work that I'm doing at Omidyar Network. Um, and the first of those is that belonging and repair go hand in hand. Um, we know that that there have been ruptures in society that have um, occurred without repair. Um, and in an American context, that has caused what we have found to be a hope gap, that people are yearning for a better world, yearning for a world with greater belonging, yet the more time that passes without redress, the less optimistic um, and hopeful that they are that this will actually occur. And so our work is really trying to address how do you begin to bridge that, help, that hope gap in between belonging and repair? Um, next slide. Um, and so these are the, the North Stars of our two um, sets of portfolios. One around new belonging, that's really this future forward looking paradigm shifting notion of how do we begin to envision and practice belonging um, now as our communities continue to grow more diverse. And the work that I will be leading shortly that's soon to come is really around cultivating repair. So acknowledging the fact that we can't move toward the future without acknowledging the fact that we are carrying the past with us wherever we go and however we get there. And so it's important to acknowledge the harm that has already happened and to enable people to practice repair and to be able to um, to do that across communities and generations. Um, so next slide. Uh, so starting with that, we can talk about repair and very broad notions. I heard the very end of the, the last speaker talking about reparations. And so I just wanna ground us in a metaphor of what, what we know to be true about repair. So next slide. So when the land suffers from a harm, like a fire perhaps, or a drought, we know that it will find ways to come back to life, such as the little tuft of grass that you see here. Um, next slide. Um, those green shoots will grow over time. They'll start to take root. And as uh, more and more begin to grow and hopefully grow stronger, um, next slide, we will eventually get to a point where we see the forest regrown and like hopefully stronger than ever before. Um, so next slide. Um, but this is what the United States at least knows to be true about repair. Um, this quote comes from one of the key uh, advocates for reparations in ja for Japanese internment after World War II in the United States. And it's really getting to the heart of what we're trying to redress, which is that repair is not just about materially what happened, that is important, but really what we're trying to get at this cultural habit that the United States have of, of abandoning what's broken, hiding history, and avoiding repair altogether. And we know that culture can and does change so that rupture can take place. So next slide. So headline number two, we know that if we have healthy ecosystems that these diverse remedies will be able to take root. Uh, we know that there are green shoots um, kind of all over the landscape of this work going on, but amid all these hostile conditions, a lot of elite capture, a lot of political suppression, and of course, cultural backlash, um, especially in the United States, it's making it impossible for repair to take root. Um, so next slide. So here are some examples of what we know that are some forms of repair, of course, materials, so things like reparations, certainly financial reparations and land back. Um, funders have certainly contributed to the inability for us to achieve even material repair because of things like elite capture, scarce and undependable, uh, undependable resourcing, and just an overemphasis on this particular form of repair um, as well. And so next slide. What we're trying to do at Omidyar Network is broaden beyond inclusive of material repair, but get, getting into relational repair, some more healing, um, kind of gathering, really focusing on building relationships and building solidarity. Um, and then next slide. And really leaning into the cultural and spiritual practices, both that have ex existed historically um, and among ancestral practices, as well as new rituals and new memorials and sort of new forms of cultural expression, which have yet to be created in the world that we are trying to embody and live into. Um, so next slide. 
So third headline, we're really aiming to um, nourish the soil so that repair can take place. Because we know that these green shoots are here, they're struggling in really hostile conditions. A lot of what we're trying to do is provide that level of nourishment, that level of connection, the ability to collaborate, and importantly, a space for dreaming and a space for imagination. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the Adrian Marie Brown quote that's really around the fact that we are living in an imagination battle. And so this heart, this work really takes that to heart and is focusing on how do we hold space for people to be able to dream and co-create together um, what this world can look like. Um, so next slide. Um, so to that end, we're really thinking about um, what are the wide range of practices that we need to address the wide range of harms that have taken place. We know that the harms just weren't material in nature. Communities were broken. Families were broken. Um, cultures were either erased. Language was erased. Lineage was broken. And so the forms of repair that we're really trying to encourage are meant to redress the forms of harm that have taken place. And so the heart of this work is really aiming to broaden notions of what we consider to be repair, broaden notions of what is possible uh, when repair takes place, and also broaden ways that which all of us can begin to take uh, practice repair in our communities. Um, so next slide. Um, so one example comes from one of our grantees, Illuminative. They have built the first Native-centric narrative engagement model that has really moved Native representation, not just in pop culture, but in government. The United States now has the first Native leader in our Department of Interior, which oversees the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, the um, And then they've also really focused on addressing the modern day manifestation of discrimination against Indigenous peoples in the United States, which is invisibility. Next slide. Um, this is Liberation Ventures, another one of our grantees. They are a funder that's focused on accelerating the Black-led movement for repair. Um, and they're starting with the vision of what does it really mean to live in a world without repair. Their report, um, A Dream in Our Name, just came out in February. So I suggest for all of you to take a look at that. Um, and it really starts with this notion that reparations is not just about the past. It's about bridging the past to the future. And that reparations isn't just a uh, sort of a material sort of project. It's, it's a cultural project. It's an imaginative project. And it's really about us deciding to be who we want to be as humans and who we want to be together. Next slide. And lastly, another one of our grantees, um, Richard Wallace in e at Eat Chicago, so Equity and Transformation Chicago. Um, his work is focused on supporting um, the greater integration of post-incarcerated uh, people after they've been released. Um, into uh, both the economy and society. One hallmark of his work has been um, starting reparations for folks who've been victimized by the war, the war on drugs, um, using um, revenue from recreational cannabis in Illinois. Um, but importantly, really, uh, Richard sees his work as a sort of membership-based organization to create space for healing. That space for healing is meant to be for both building alternatives for, for the world that we need to have to exist in, and also a place to reconnect people to the lost lineage, land, and language as a result of, of those um, harms that have taken place. And next and final slide. So lastly, our work is really focusing on, again, this ecosystem approach. How do we begin to have repair that's more connected so that we can have many more approaches be able to harmonize and take root, more collaborative so that local and national efforts can work in tandem. Much of the reparations work in the United States is taking place at a local level at this point with some limited state level effort, but we know that, the, that all of that needs to be collaborative um, in order to be effective. And then lastly, creative, that we need to hold space for the creative of capacity um, to make repair um, desirable, to make it seem that it's possible to, that we can begin to address that hope gap. Thank you. Anna, it would be great if we could see Vanessa's face just to say goodbye. I don't know if that's possible. Sorry, this setup is, is not one where we can see the speaker at the same time as slides. Vanessa, thank you so much for your time. And I would really recommend looking at, yeah, it, it's how Vanessa's growing the ecosystem around the work and the, pra the multiple practices that she's bringing in. Um, thanks for joining us today, Vanessa. And um, now we're going to have James Bridal, who is 
dialing in from Greece, I think, an island somewhere in Greece, and wisely has decided not to use the slides. Um, so you get to see his face. <laughs> um, and James is going to be talking about his work around planetary intelligence. Uh, thank you very much, Cassie, and uh, thank you, everybody. Um, uh, yeah, I will talk briefly about my work. Um, I'm a writer and artist. Uh, my work has previously largely been about the kind of social and political implications of technology, how the internet affects our everyday life, how it feels like the impenetrability of so many of the technologies that surround us are kind of difficulty in understanding really the basics of how a lot of the stuff we use every day actually works, uh, impact our abilities to act meaningfully and with justice in the world. I trace a lot of uh, contemporary ills down to the kind of opacity of the things that surround us. Um, and in, but in the last few years, I've tried to reorient my practice uh, towards ecology and the environment as kind of one of the most important things around these days. And I spent quite a lot of time trying to work out what it was that I could, I could find a purchase on when talking about ecology and the environment from my perspective as background, uh, as a, from technology. And the way in that I found was to, to think, uh, to think and, and try and think more broadly um, and widely about the notion of intelligence. Um, because we exist in this really fascinating and strange moment when we are completely and culturally obsessed with this thing called artificial intelligence, which I don't even particularly want to talk about very much, but it's like this huge, strange thing that everyone's getting excited about. Just at the moment when, when decades of really fascinating work in the natural sciences are making us realize the extraordinary ability and intelligences of non-human beings of all kinds, um, and that we're starting to finally, in, in the Western dominant scientific discourse, take seriously uh, the, the traditional knowledges of um, non-Western cultures that have always acclaimed the non-human as having its own beingness, um, beinghood and intelligence. And so um, my work that was largely in a book that came out last year called Ways of Being uh, talks about the ways in which everything is intelligent. Um, the fact that um, uh, intelligence manifests in all different ways in all beings that we consider living and, and quite possibly in many that we don't uh, in, in, in rocks, mountains and ecosystems as much as in frogs, uh, bogs, uh, tiny bacteria, slime molds, strange fungi that are capable of performing mathematical calculations that outstrip even our most powerful supercomputers. Um, quick example of what I'm talking about. Uh, and, and that's an example both about non-humans and about us. Uh, one of my favorite examples of intelligence um, and how we fail to recognize or how we misunderstand it uh, is the gibbon. Uh, gibbons for a long time um, were not considered to be intelligent by the dominant science. Oh dear, it's a bit windy. I hope that's not bothering the mic. Um, not uh, as intelligent as other uh, apes or even monkeys, uh, because they refuse to perform all these tasks, right? We give, we give monkeys and gorillas a stick and, and like a treat outside their cage because we always kept them in cages because we're terrible, um, and, and, and see if they used a stick to grab it. And, and the gorillas would, and the chimpanzees would, and the bonobos would, but the gibbons never would. And so within the eyes of science, within this particular scientific way of seeing the world, the gibbons were not regarded as being as intelligent uh, or, or as intelligent as at all. They didn't pass this kind of arbitrary line that we created. And then after like 20 years of this kind of research, someone redesigned the experiment. And what they did was that they hung these sticks, these tools from the top of the gibbons enclosure rather than leaving them on the floor. And immediately the gibbons went, oh, and started eating. Uh, and they use the tools, uh, which they've been capable of doing all along. But gibbons are brachiators. They live in the trees most of the time. And so their, their whole being, their intelligence is oriented upwards and spatially different to us. Because intelligence, your awareness of the world, your experience of it, and thus the knowledge you have of it, is, is, is based on your physiognomy, on your body pattern, on your experience of the world and the ways you encounter it. And that is true for all beings. All beings encounter the world as um, uh, creatures that live in the world and have their own particular experience of it, and thus know particular things about it and have certain kinds of knowledge of it that manifest differently. So intelligence isn't just something that happens in the head. It's something that's kind of done, performed with the whole body, and it's manifested in relationship. 
So it happens when you encounter other things, which is why I say you can understand intelligence as existing within even non-living artifacts, because they allow this intelligence to exist between us in these different kinds of ways. So that's the kind of question I'm interested in, in opening up in my work. But I'm also really, really interested in the, the very practical applications of those things. What does it mean to take seriously this notion of diverse kinds of intelligence, uh, both within human communities and beyond? And how might those actually be kind of used to produce types of change? Um, one model that I'm very interested in, I work with a little bit within human communities, is what are known as citizens' assemblies, uh, which some of you might know about and, and some not. Citizens' assemblies are a form of governance um, in which um, instead of having either kind of an elected body of representatives or a, a narrow group of domain experts, uh, you select a body at random from the population. So you literally, you do a lottery, you get a bunch of as random as possible people from all walks of life, and you put them uh, in rooms together, and you give them presentations from experts who can advise them and tell them about issues, but not determine the outcomes. And crucially, you give those people power. You connect them to governance in ways that allow like, some of their recommendations to, to achieve things. And it turns out that under that system, really extraordinary things happen. Uh, if you've heard of a citizens' assembly, it's probably the Irish citizens' assembly, uh, which reported its, its work on the environment uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, but previous to that was, was the body that recommended uh, the referendum on abortion that ultimately led to the overturning of that law. And what's interesting about the Irish Assembly, and many like it, is that these assemblies, typically made up of random selections from people, are capable of coming to consensus, which is not something we even really tend to think about anymore as in such diverse uh, and divided societies that we live in. And they're also capable of coming up with really quite radical answers to things, things that, that our current political system doesn't really allow for. Uh, they tend to go further than kind of existing political solutions. Um, and they come up with really novel answers to things. Um, they seem to be an incredibly powerful tool. And the power of that tool, the power of that experience, because of course these people are also transformed by the experience of being part of an assembly, um, is that, um, it, it, that that power seems to emerge from this diversity of different forms of intelligence working together, all these different um, ways of life, personal experiences, personal histories, produce novel suggestions, novel policies for really thorny, complex problems like the kind that we're facing in this kind of polycrisis times. Um, so something really interesting happens when you bring all these intelligences together. And so one of the things um, I think is important to think about is if, on the one hand, we have this situation where where everything is intelligent uh, and everything is really everyone, um, everything its own kind of living, intelligent, active, knowledge-bearing being, uh, whether that's human, animal, plant, mineral, machine, um, then, and, and, and we know that the most interesting novel solutions to complex thorny problems that seem almost insoluble in our present time are produced by bringing together the widest possible variety of intelligences and experiences and knowledge as we can, then we obviously need to think about how to include non-humans, the more than humans, animals, plants, machines, and much else into our democratic and decision-making processes in things like systems assemblies. What would that look like? I don't really know, um, but I'm trying to figure it out. Um, <laughs> My, um, one of my main projects at the moment um, is really trying to take the ideas that were in this book, Ways of Being, and, and work out what they would look like in the real world. Uh, and one of those things is a project called Server Farm, um, where I'm essentially trying to build a very large biological computer um, in which you take all the systems that would exist within these kind of digital computers that we're using at present, which are the product of all kinds of information capture, uh, oil extraction, all of those other things, um, uh, replace each of those with biological components. Uh, so you have plants that are capable of changing colors depending on uh, information and soil um, systems that they grow in. You have fungi and other microorganisms that are capable of processing and transmitting information. Uh, you can store information in seed banks in various ways. There's a whole range of this stuff I don't have time to go into. Uh, but critically, you also don't treat those things as merely biological components. You treat them as active rights-bearing participants in a collective process 
in which everybody's contributions are valid and are brought together and respected. And so you create both a framework for coming up with novel solutions to old problems, and you also create a new political framework of relationships in which all, um, all beings are valued equally, uh, which is utterly foundational to the repair and regeneration that our planet, our society, and the whole terrestrial sphere uh, needs in the present moment. Um, and that's 10 minutes. So thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. Um, I know we sort of all giggled a bit when James said, I don't really know how to do that. But what I love about James's work is he is literally trying to work out how to do it by building it. And, you know, this isn't just about creating a persona of a plant or an animal and bringing it into your decision making, although that's a good step along the journey. Um, James is really trying to figure out what does it really mean to bring all those types of intelligence together? Um, I would really recommend his book, Ways of Being. And you know, maybe the server farm that James is prototyping will become a way that everyone makes decisions about how they move their resources, because it would truly take into account all the intelligences within the planet, not just the human ones. Um, and do it's really weird for people to probably join for 10 minutes and then we sort of boot them out. So do you like leave questions or anything in the on the platform as well so we can share any feedback or reflections with the speakers after. Thanks a lot, James, for joining us. Thank you, Cassie. Thanks, everyone. Have a lovely day. Bye. Um, so now we've got an in-person person. So that's good. I can I'll get out of the way. And uh, we've now got Louis VI, who is going to share with us um, some of the work he's involved in with Earth Percent. Do you want to swap, or are you happy just sitting there? Uh, I can sit, yeah. I mean, you're welcome to stand. Um, you've, what have you would got be, a clicker? What, what's more, what would get people more excited? Well, what would, you, what, <laughs> <laughs> what would get you more excited? Where are you most comfortable? All right, I'll stand up. Go on, then. All right. Let's do it. I don't think I need this. I think I've got a lapel mic, so I don't want double feedback. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Louis. VI. Um, is, that that your, twice. is that your notes? Oh, that is my notes. Um, though, <clears throat> hopefully I won't need them. Ten minutes is, is weird, because it's either a, a really long time or a really short time, depending how much you prepared. Um, <laughs> I'm prepared, though. My, so, my name is Louis VI, and I'm a musician, an artist, filmmaker, but most of all, I'm just a massive nature geek, and I... Yeah, I studied zoology and specialized. The bit that I was really interested in was sensory ecology, which is basically the sensory perception of different animals and organisms of this planet. And we're, as humans, we're super visual, actually. But weirdly, I work in the audio world. Um, and every organism, I mean, between us, we have different perceptions, but every organism has a different perception. It's weirdly called umwelt, which is one of those words that doesn't really feel like it means what it means, but it does. Um, but that's kind of my geeky background. And so I've been trying to find a way to get my two loves of music and nature to kind of combine, all in the context of this crazy climate crisis that we're in. Um, and then also my background uh, on my dad's side, I'm Caribbean and from a little nature island called Dominica which is pretty infamous for being pretty unspoiled, one of the rare unspoiled places. Um, so that's kind of my background. So I tried, to, I tried to make a project recently, an album that kind of brings that all together, but I found really quickly I'm making something in an environment and in an industry that isn't really even thinking about climate change or nature at all. Even though if you think about art and culture, um, and anything actually we've really ever had as, as humans, um, but as organisms on this planet, has all been inspired by nature at the beginning, at some point, or continuing to the present and into the future. So it's kind of one of those things I wanted to make a, a project that includes nature, but if, it just make, if it's just about nature, then I release it in the same context, in the same environment of an industry that is essentially working towards a kind of a colonial, quite 
what, in my mind, dated extractivist um, capitalist system, then you're not really doing anything. And I came across this incredible group called Earth Percent, um, which was set up by Brian Eno, Kathy Runciman, and Adam Callan. And I met them, and they're, what they're doing is so interesting and really kind of brought me in because it was so genuine and so detailed. And as it says, it's, it's using music as a means to really power the service for the planet in every end. So for the front facing, but also the back facing side. And I'll explain that. So their first initiative, which was really kind of caught me on and brought me into the fold was Earth being the co-writer. And for those that don't know, when you make a song, so if I made a song, there's a number of writers on it. I mean, sometimes it's just one person, but there can be a number of writers for this example. And you would have each of those writers would be given a percentage, and that percentage would receive a certain amount of royalties and a certain amount of money paid on a quarterly basis, depending who you're with. There's better and there's worse. Um, and their idea was to bring in Earth as a co-writer because the thing that's so beautiful is actually, you know, as I said, nature has been such an inspiration for all of us, whether we know it or not. And I think people are starting to really realize it, especially within music, that it is such a contributor to where we are. Me, me and myself, the whole album was a whole journey through different ecosystems. So to find out this, that I can then credit Earth as a writer to the project that I've done. And now I've got like 2% from all the profits of my album, once it's recouped, will go towards Earth percent to collect as a society for publishing. And then they have an incredible team of experts and scientists to then decide where that money is best used. And suddenly, you know, you scale that up and suddenly the Earth could be one of the biggest co-writers on the planet, if not the biggest. And then, you know, you're like, well, the planet should be the biggest co-writer because we're all living on it. Um, and that's, that's something that's really beautiful because I think having that team of scientists and experts and really diverse kind of panel people that are really interested directing the money means it's so well used. So every time that track's listened to, a little bit of money goes towards this pot. And they work on climate justice. They work on the green uh, transition of the music industry. They work on the just transition into clean energy. They work on legal and systemic change, biodiversity and nature renewal, which I'm pretty you know, especially into, and climate justice as well. Um, and I think the next scheme they've got going on, which is kind of in the pilot scheme, is Sounds Right, um, which is kind of furthering that. And there's a little video that will play, and then I'll talk about it. Ooh. You've got, like, two minutes. OK. Maybe it won't play. It won't play. OK, <laughs> I'll tell you about it. So. Basically, Sounds Right is a, a really great idea where they take it further and they use nature as an actual uh, contributor to the music in the sense that you can, as a musician, bring sounds from nature, from an incredible range of ecology, acoustic ecology libraries, and take nature sounds and put them into your music, and then nature is not only a co-writer, but actually one of the biggest featured artists in the world. And again, it's another way to direct for musicians to directly send music out there and collect money to be an innovative way of funding climate action. Now, I wish I'd known about this before, because I made an album that came out two months ago, um, and it's steeped and soaked in music from nature. So recordings from the Amazon, the desert, and Joshua Tree, where the whole album started. I took shrooms and Joshua Tree and got the first, <laughs> the first song, Vibrate, came out, and everything felt connected, and that was the baseline. And then I went to, back to Grey London, Tottenham studio, uh, then to Berlin, and then got to start to finish the album in Mexico, which was a bit more connected to nature and then on the Pacific coast and Oaxaca, if anyone's been there, it's just the best sunsets and the most wild ocean. Um, and then my 
really good friend, Leo Serda, who's an indigenous activist from the Quechua community in the Amazon, invited me to finish and mix the album in his community, and I got to record it. And the point is of this album is about getting the diaspora particularly, we're in a unique position that we, the places that we're from, that we're proud to be from, the flags we wave in carnival, these places are on the front line of climate change, yet the places we've grown up uh, are historically and colonially, leg they've got a colonial legacy of contributing to climate change. So we're in this unique position to build a bridge. So my album, the idea is about connecting the dots of that bridge and I feel as diaspora, we've been left out. And where I think the magic happens is in the live space um, where you get to have a moment where people on the left and right of you, right now, you may have nothing in common. I'm sure we actually have a lot in common because of the, the whole theme of this. But imagine you're in a, in a room for a gig and there's no one in, that you know. But there's that moment where the gig gets really good and you're all for use of like a biological uh, metaphor, become one organism and there's like a, there's a community vibration. And in that moment, that's the moment where you can empower people with music and empower people to take action and feel that they're not alone in this climate world. And I think the beautiful thing is you got that and we suddenly have a moment and a movement and an energy where people feel that it's about them and and we take it all the way back to the point of nature being that original inspiration for art. And I think art has always been that thing. We've had the data, we've had the science to know what's going on, but it's about the communication and it's about the change and it's about inspiring that change with feeling. And art has always been the thing that's done that and got further than words when words fail. So these are the moments and I think what Earth Percent is doing and in music might be the way that we can inspire some change through art. Do you want to swap? Yes. How about see? <laughs> um, thanks, uh, Louis. And um, you're going to hear Louis VI, I should say. Um, That's okay. After. Uh, mu music with drinks will be provided for by. Uh, <laughs> uh, not the drinks. I'm not yeah, not the drinks. Not the drinks. Um, so yeah, and I, I just think I love everything about that work for how it's trying to bring in artists and culture makers, thinking about also the role of the law. Um, I think there's lots in there for people that are trying to shift wealth to be inspired by. Um, and so now I'm going to hand over to Iona. Um, are you going to stand up? Are you going to stay there? I think I'm going to sit. That's fine. Is that all right? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> Quite nervous. Um, I haven't done this in a really long time. Um, because for the last four years, uh, with Cassie and various other people in this room, um, uh, I've been building this work, the practice that I'm about to talk about, um, through lots of research and consultancy. And this is the first time I'm speaking about it publicly. Um, so, first, an invitation. This is not the finished product. <laughs> um, if something in here speaks to you, because this speaks to your experience and you'd like us to know something, or if it makes you want to run for the hills, I want to know both of those things, because we are trying to perfect the offer and the framing. So uh, my name is Iona Lawrence and I am a freelancer in the nonprofit space in the UK. And in 2016, I set up and then ran the foundation in memory of my friend, the MP, Joe Cox. And it was being director of that organization, which set out from the very beginning to just exist for five years, that revealed to me the power of designing in endings, designing in the organization, organization's death and crucially, a life beyond it. This was a decision that was later reversed, but that's a conversation for another day. Um, so fast forward seven years from setting up that organization. Um, one of the many things I now do in order to upskill and build confidence around endings for nonprofits is that I spend a handful of hours a week manning what we're calling the endings hotline. 
staff or trustees of nonprofits get to hear about us mostly through word of mouth, but sometimes through funders or infrastructure organizations. And I give them a one-off, one-time free coaching session. And these conversations always start the same way. I get on Zoom and I try and smile, but most of the time people uh, look like rabbits in the headlights. And I say, so tell me what brings you here? And every single conversation of the hundreds that we have now had starts in broadly the same way, with someone taking a great big deep intake of breath and saying, I haven't said this to anyone yet, but I think the game is up and the time has come for my role or my organization or a part of this organization or the work I do. And these confessional spaces of care and compassion, as well as we hope heaps of practical advice, are needed because civil society is trapped in a game. And this is a game in which nonprofit leaders, funders and stakeholders, fueled by deep passion, belief, hope and, of course, a good drizzle of ego, um, have been led to believe that the brave, bold, ambitious thing is to start something new, to chart uncharted waters, to grow relentlessly and to survive at all costs. This is a game in which none of the incentives are in place within or outside of ourselves to reflect or be honest about what isn't working and what has served its purpose or now needs to move aside. And the resources and power in this space, in this field, in this sector, move in such a way that underpin and drive this growth and survival at all costs agenda. So um, one of the people I work with said, don't bother saying this, it's been said already. But just to be really clear, this matters now more than ever because as communities and societies grapple with sustained poly crises, insert all the things that there are many people here more well placed to talk about than me, um, many of the organizations and movements that exist to drive and change and promote human and planetary flourishing are creaking under the the pressure of possible endings, of organizations, of projects, of programs, of services, of business models, of leadership styles, and of whole systems that no longer serve us. And they're being held back from good endings, which could unleash new chapters by the shame, fear, avoidance, and stigma associated with them. So four years ago, uh, this work um, was initiated by Cassie Robinson uh, with a small Ideas and Pioneers Fund uh, grant from the Paul Hamlin Foundation to explore the idea of a fund specifically to help organisations to consider closure. I was initially involved as a researcher and have gone on to work with Louise Armstrong, who you might have heard today as well, and a host of other amazing people in this brilliant, small, budding field of practice. And together we consider and design all sorts of endings for so far about 93 organizations and counting. And as I said, these are closures, these are mergers, these are program terminations, they're when funders decide to stop funding things, they're when founders or CEOs want to move on. All of the endings that make up the life cycle of an organization. So, um, what gets the good, oh, this is such a boring slide, I actually shouldn't have slides. <laughs> We're gonna go back here. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Um, so, what gets in the way? Loads of stuff. You're all mowing through loads of this stuff every day, but basically endings are obviously taboo because we all think they're failure and defeat. We're all trapped in this game of surviving at all costs, and this means that most of the time my phone goes because people are like, help, we've got no time and money left, what do we do? And I'm like, well, there are very few options. Um, uh, we've got loads of terrible weak governance with remote boards who don't even know each other and they don't know their organisations and they're taking terrible decisions for many, many years at a time. Um, and if and when you do decide something needs to end or close, people come to you and say, oh, have you looked at the Charity Commission? That's only going to tell you about the legal, the technical, the practical, but nothing about the emotional, the relational. And most of the work that's involved in this stuff, as lots of people have talked about in lots of ways today, is emotional and relational, so we need to bring those things in. And those who fund charities, sadly, often don't see the ends of cycles as their responsibility or priority. And a lot of the work I do is to support organisations to make the case to their funders that if something needs to end, it needs to be resourced and given enough time and consideration. And finally, it can be hard to find people like me who actually find this stuff interesting and want to help because most people want to run for the hills. So throughout our work over the last four years, 93 organisations, it's becoming abundantly clear um, that with sufficient time and care and funding, most of these things can be overcome. And endings can be moments of true growth with limitless power for redistribution and composting. Lessons can be learned, transformation is ushered in and a new, bold, ambitious chapter commences for the people and the missions and the projects involved. 
So one example, which is not really my story to tell because um, someone called Martha McKenzie and her team are in the room, but if we take Campaign Bootcamp, who also I know some people here worked for, they closed after 10 years and their decision to share their learnings with our support meant that there are um, many promising signs that the wider sector is building on their experience. And if you haven't seen that report, lots of people haven't because I didn't do probably enough promotion of it, go read it. It's one of the things I'm probably most proud of ever having been a part of helping bring into the world. And it was an account of what it took to grow and close that organization with lots of rich learnings, not just for organizations who are thinking about uh, closing, but lots of things that you're probably busy with every day. Meanwhile, um, the birth of the Civic Power Fund with campaign boot camps remaining funds, whose strategy and vision obviously builds directly on the learnings of campaign boot camp, is showing promising signs of success, which is our massive understatement. So, um, six months ago, we, uh, which is basically a small handful of us, but also huge legions of people across the sector who are interested and supportive of this work, we started to ask ourselves, what can we do to turn this game on its head? How can we widen the concept of bravery, courage, and ambition? What if it was considered brave for civil society to be led with energy and tenacity and ambition and vigor, but whilst also holding the end in mind? Starting as soon as tomorrow by asking ourselves, what might need to end? Not because this question determines that something will end, but because staying open to the possibility of it unleashes purpose, conviction, and a relentless pursuit of what is absolutely necessary and most impactful. So this is where the decelerator comes in. Think for a second about all the stuff that exists to bring new things into the world. Accelerator programs, leadership schemes, money, people who've written books, there are whole master's programs. Anything for the endings of things? Not so much. And this is what we want in a very small way to start trying to seed an idea around, which is the idea that this stuff needs attention and care and expertise and support. So building on the four years of work we've done researching this stuff, designing tools which you can find on our website, supporting people through this work, doing this hotline, um, and lots of consultancy for those who need it. We're taking the uncomfortable slightly ironic step of starting something to help other people <laughs> stop. I think it's the right thing, but um, I'm feeling confident. Um, and when I say stop, people stop doing things, what I really mean is mostly what we try and do is slow people down for long enough that they can decide whether something does need to end. And if that decision is taken, we are there to support them to do it well and to do it um, carefully and with a, a sort of a vision for legacy, it's all about legacy. How do you capture what needs to remain and discard what needs to go? So from September, with the support of three uh, major UK trusts and foundations, which is very exciting, but I'm not allowed to tell you who they are yet, we are entering a design phase for six to nine months to build a time-bound project to try and change the game on endings. We're excited to be incubated by new constellations who you might have uh, heard of whose work on new beginnings is an integral part of our cyclical vision for civil society. And so what we will do is continue lots of the work we've done already, but try and work out ways that we can reach more people and start to change mindsets and behaviours and cultures in the non-profit sector and perhaps even beyond, but one step at a time. Um, the decelerator itself will support organisations and individuals to consider and design closures, mergers, CO transitions, programming endings, and all sorts of endings as just part of the everyday life of organisations and inevitable changes um, in civil society. And we will work with funders, partners, and stakeholders to show how better endings can make a world of difference. So back to the beginning, if any of this appeals to you or makes you want to run for the hills, I would love you to get in touch. You can like find my email or whatever uh, on the internet because uh, we need people like you to tell us what in here is looking promising and what we shouldn't say again because we're not going to appeal to the people we want to. So thank you. Thanks, Iona. And um, yeah, I think... I mean, I'm a bit biased, but I do love this work. And, um, and, and, and primarily because it really is the most overlooked aspect of change work. If anyone's interested in transitions or systems change or whatever you want to call it, no one has ever paid enough attention to endings. And someone took the piss out of me, excuse my language, on Twitter last week because I talked about composting um, in relation to this sort of work. But as always, like the natural world is a great um, teacher and we need to ensure that endings create good compost. 
um, there's enough toxicity in civil society. And yeah, so I'm so impressed with how Iona has been building that work. I don't know why I feel I need to stand here when we've got an international person joining, but I do. Um, so hopefully now we are going to have Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan. Thanks for joining us. Um, and yeah, over, straight over to you. Uh, great. Well, good, good afternoon. Uh, greeting from Los Angeles. Uh, I was just in London uh, two weeks ago, and I wish I was still there to attend uh, really this fantastic event in person. So congratulations to all the organizers. Um, so today, the practice I'm sharing is an idea that I've been developing at the Bruin Institute uh, and that we'll be publishing as a book next spring. Uh, and this is an idea that we call planetary governance. Uh, but before we get to planetary governance, uh, first, let's take a minute to understand what I mean by uh, the planetary. So uh, next slide or... There we go. Um, so the concept of the planetary represents a holistic vision of the planet as consisting of an almost infinitely complex, interlaced, and nested array of dynamically interacting biological, chemical, energetic, and geological systems, which in turn informs a new understanding of the place and role of human beings within this vast system. So at the macrocosmic scale, we now know that human activity is deeply interconnected with atmospheric chemistry and the Earth's climate. At the microcosmic scale, discoveries about the human microbiome have revealed our deep entanglement with bacteria and other microorganisms. So this new idea stands in contrast to the familiar language of the global. The familiarity of the language, however, masks an unfamiliar distinction, I want to argue. For the global of globalization, as the historian Dipesh Chakrabarti has pointed out, is not the same as the global of global climate change. The global of globalization is a category, a concept that frames the earth in human terms, right? So globalization's human-centric understanding of the worldwide integration of the last few decades, the accelerating flow of people, our goods, ideas, money, data, and so on. But the global of global climate change, by contrast, frames the Earth without specific reference to, to us humans. This globe references a vast unified system fueled by solar rays whose most salient features are physical and biogeochemical processes, the fluxes of gas, liquids, solids, and energy on and around the third celestial object in the sun. Now, this vision of the global makes plain that Earth is not humanity's alone. We share it with other living beings, with non-living matter and forms of energy. And so the global of global climate change affects humans and is affected by humans, but it was here before us and will be here long after us. So this version of the global is clearly a different concept, a different frame of reference from the global of globalization, which humans manufactured into being with low-cost maritime shipping and, and worldwide banking networks. So the incongruity between these two global ideas requires that we distinguish between them. So I'm going to suggest that the human-centric global of globalization can remain the global or the globe, but the Earth-centric globe of global climate change is better understood as the planet or the planetary. So seen this way, the planet is an interdependent whole, but this condition of interdependence did not emerge from the intentional work of humans. Rather, it comes out of the Earth's biogeochemistry and th thermodynamics that we're only one part of. Uh, so we stand inside and among it, not outside, the various flows of life, matter, energy that circulate uh, over time and through space in the Earth system. Uh, next slide, please. So the question then becomes, well, that's, that's all well and good, but what do we do about it? And so the answer that I want to offer now is that we entirely rethink how we govern um, so that we need to design and build governance in institutions, by which I mean the institutionalized social rules that tell us how we're supposed to live in common, that are attuned to our fundamentally, inextricably planetary condition. The planetary governance means governing that takes seriously and puts at the fore the basic fact that we live on a planet. Right? So like I said, we live on a planet. It's a basic, even obvious statement, but when you really consider it, it requires a radical transformation of nearly all aspects of collective life. So planetary governance is a vision for a new institutional structure for the world. But that vision can't just be the imposition of one way of living, right? Us human beings are too diverse for that to work or to be even desirable. At the same time, we live on one systematically interdependent planet. 
There are 8 billion of us living amidst countless other species and varied ecosystems throughout the Earth system. We can't wish away the, either of those facts or run roughshod over this reality. Instead, we have to confront an intractable question, which is how do we foster diverse dreams and diverse communities while simultaneously building large-scale institutions for the management of planetary risks? How do we do that? Now, today I'm actually not going to answer that question um, because what I want to uh, suggest is that the really the real importance of planetary governance and the reason I want to speak about it today here is just asking the question. It's in reframing the debate around the idea of the planetary and what living in an interdependent planet even means. Uh, next slide. So why planetary governance now? Why is this idea emerging now? Why am I presented today? So I want to so two factors have converged in the past decade plus that have brought forth this idea. The first is that is planetary sapience has revealed our planetary condition. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, planetary sapience is a technologically enabled self-understanding of the planet and its deep interconnectedness. So to make the statement a little clearer, uh, let me give an example. We only know that massive or distributed phenomena like climate change are systemic and planetary rather than merely a series of disconnected local events because of planetary sapience, this technolo technologically mediated self-understanding. Without a planetary array of instruments, algorithms, and integrated computing stacks to sense and make the patterns visible, it's doubtful that anyone by themselves could notice the Earth's 1.1 degrees Celsius of warming over the last few decades, right? So in, in, in some regions where the change has been more dramatic, like the Arctic, people, and particularly members of indigenous communities, have been able to personally experience the change at the local level, but not for the planet as a whole. It's only in the data produced by Earth's technological distributed sensory organ of orbiting satellites, mountaintop observatories, seaborne gauges, ice core drills, all of which interpreted by, by computer models, um, oh no. Oh, we might be able to help. Um, oh, oh boy. <laughs> uh, my computer has decided it needs to restart right now. Oh, no. <laughs> so just when I was extolling, oh God. <laughs> and all Don honestly, I might disappear. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Jonathan, <laughs> just maybe... Um, show us your face so we can at least see you as you die. <laughs> Honestly, it is, it's taken hold of my screen. Oh, there we go. All right, am I there? Yeah, yeah. Yes, we can see you. Okay, uh, what the hell? <laughs> Some planetary force is trying to... Yeah. Yeah. We've um, only got a couple more minutes, Jonathan, so I wait, don't know if there's... Anyway, like, well, so... You want to let me, let the key thing before, before I... The, I'm, I'm killed off by technology. Um, <laughs> I'm really, I'm, I'm very sorry about this. Uh, and, and thank you for inviting me if, I, if I'm gone. <laughs> I understand if you don't want me back. Um, so planetary sapience has enabled, enabled this, um, this self-understanding. Uh, at the same time, what it's revealing is that we've, we've been systematically screwing up the planet for, for quite a long time now. It's revealed... Uh, this, this planetary hole. So as a final point, then, uh, I want to talk, and I guess this next slide. We're not seeing the slides anyway, Jonathan. So just, don't no, worry. <laughs> that one wasn't important. Um, is what, I just want to pose the question of what does thinking about this way uh, do for us? What kind of transformations does it enable? And the idea here is that by thinking in terms of the planetary, thinking of the planet as a unit, as something to which we can attribute benefits, costs, uh, calculate trade-offs, think about uh, exchange, it opens an entirely new way of, of thinking beyond the typical way that we think about things belonging to the nation state, the community. Thinking about the planet as one integrated whole uh, you know, allows us to, or really actually forces us to, uh, think about uh, how we would uh, deal with these exchanges, the distribution of resources, and questions of, of justice. Um, so with that, uh, thank you. Sorry for the technical glitch.
thank you, Jonathan, because uh, that can't have been easy. Um, and I, yeah, we'll, we'll share your slides afterwards. And I would highly recommend looking more at the work that Jonathan and the institute he works for is doing. And I can imagine some of you might be sitting there like thinking, what, does, what is planetary governance? How does this relate? And I guess part of the point of this session is to be zooming in and zooming out. And, you know, we can do work in neighborhoods, but if no one's paying attention to how we're governing these planetary systems, then what's the point of doing the stuff in the neighborhood? You know, it, it's so interconnected. And I think we sometimes forget this scale of things because it can feel so far removed and so difficult. So I'm really grateful that there's people like Jonathan paying attention to that. And I think when we think about the, how we move resources around, some people need to be moving them to that kind of work as well. So thank you, Jonathan, for joining us. And um, yeah, we... We hope to see you again. <laughs> and so now we're going to move on to um, the wonderful Fazana Khan, who is actually in Colombia somewhere, and um, so can't be here. So we've actually got a pre-recording from her, which she sent me one, and it was 14 minutes, so I had to brutally cut it um, to nine. Um, so <laughs> some of the, the full recording will be on the Spot Me platform. So I hope when it starts, it's going to make sense. Um, so over to Fazana. Given that we are what we practice, how can we practice new ways together and new solutions and strategies? And for us at Healing Justice, you'll hear this frame. Uh, phrase a lot rehearsing freedoms um, and as Ruth Wilson Gilmore says we have to rehearse the new social order coming into being and what it means to whatever we are demanding we want to be able to do that out loud and publicly and be able to see it in our environments in our and in our societies so really playing with these ideas of what do we need to rehearse and how can we rehearse together new futures and understanding that it's a practice um, and that we're figuring out together and holding that one of the key kind of frameworks I want to speak to is disability justice. Um, disability justice um, built from uh, decades of organizing and framed by Patty Byrne from Sins Invalid and their incredible organizing. If Seth, if we can go to the next slide, really speak to um, how uh, oppression intersects with disability and uh, previously when we hear about disability we might hear it in the context of disability rights which relies a lot on litigation and a kind of rights framework but disability justice here also understands the intersections in which we are also disabled and made chronically sick through oppression but also that um the ways in which other forms of oppression intersect with disability and create more vulnerability and more oppression. There are 10 pr principles that can be understood as also design principles. Um, how do we design um, just, accessible, um, intersectional, sustainable um, futures um, on a very micro level from our events to our relationships, but also on a much more scaled and structural level. And these are uh, 10 that you can look up. Um, but on the next slide, I'll just draw out a few that I really wanted to speak to that I think are really important for philanthropy and um, and how we move towards um, mobilizing resources in this time where it needs to be mobilized. So, Sefi, to the next slide. Um, first, we know that philanthropy is an extension of capitalism. And so we need to be embedding the role of philanthropy also in an anti-capitalist lens, like understanding what is the strategic role that philanthropy can play in moving money, doing the reparative justice work and under moving away from also its extractive relationship to who it's funding, what it funds, and not having a relationship to our bodies, our souls, our beings that reproduces this capitalist lo logic of brutalizing bodies, being extractive, being transactional, but moving towards a more wholesome politics that understands we are not just capital, but that we're moving towards something that liberates us from this, this um, economic model and that f funders and philanthropy are being explicit, not only in holding an anti-capitalist politics, but also liberating resources in that direction and understanding the role, the strategic role that funders could be playing in that. The second um, 
is cross commitment to cross movement organizing often philanthropy wants to see itself as like you know just moving money we don't have time for that we need to see ourselves allied and alongside all the other movements um that are critical right now and really being able to understand how ableism and disability um justice can also speak to and show us the ways our all our contexts have been designed to brutalize our bodies to re to make us sick to disable us to not include also particular types of bodies like racialized bodies working class bodies queer um bodies non binary bodies so really holding that how does the work that we do in philanthropy really get intimate with allying with other struggles and seeing itself in that movement with a capital m this one's a harder one the the third one of recognizing our wholeness because we are in a anglo anglo eurocentric colonized mindset which really sees everything as commodity our relational politics is one of capitalism and what what disability justice really affirms is a paradigm shift that understands our wholeness with sickness with disability without um our lives being centered on productivity or desirability or or how v- valuable that society considers us so inviting us to a different relational politics with one another that really understands our wholeness and doesn't see us in these metrics of productive valuable desirable and that is something again that funders on a personal level but also in your in your um teams in your organizings can be seeking to practice um the third is sustainability that recognizing we need different pace and that doesn't always mean slowing down um that i think that can be a quite um diluted understanding but understanding sometimes what is the rhythm and the pace that our work needs sometimes um you know um given the level of oppression we may have to move up pace but how can that become sustainable who with the privilege the resources can move up pace so others can rest and slow down what is an ecological way that we can organize and sustain this work in a long term sense and that is completely tied to having a deeper understanding of oppression and trauma and um and whose bodies get impacted in which way and so you can't really do sustainability and build an a, a more ecological rotary system that helps us move appropriately to time and pace without also understanding dynamics of power of who gets to rest who feels safety in their body who gets to move quickly and who doesn't and who do we need to move quickly and who do do we not and philanthropy does need to move quickly um that is its role but it needs to understand who in philanthropy can do that and who can't and what are the ways that it can do that that doesn't make people collateral damage and just because we are speaking to disability justice i also wanted to draw this one out that there is no homogenous you know way of looking at disability solidarity that there are nuances and complex and complexities in that and it's all of our work to get closer to understanding what that disability solidarity can look like we know the pandemic is disabling we know racism as enkem and defo who've probably already met today has said racism is the first pandemic uh, is disabling and understanding the kind of chronic stress the chronic sickness that our bodies go under um and we have with more diseases with the loss of biodiversity and um and just the ways that our societies have been designed to be so unsustainable that we anticipate more forms of of sickness and that all of us will experience being disabled or chronically sick at some point and so how do we actually really get again intimate with this understanding so we can design our societies our futures and philanthropy can also invest in those infrastructures that hold um we are flourishing in that sickness in that disability and and hold the different ways that that will look because it will be pluriversal it won't look one way and it won't look one way um even for dominant bodies um and so really expanding our imagination and also our, our ability to ally and move i know i've zoomed through quite a lot i've tried to be really mindful of time i know we only had like 10 minutes um but i hope that this has given you a little bit of a 
um, a, a, a taster, but also an invitation and provocation to really uh, do the work we all have to be studying and that the disability justice movement for for time has been um, leading the work and is leading the work also on a climate justice lens. And these are really pertinent times in which we can be learning, allying and and building alternatives, which is most practiced by our incredible disability justice movement leaders. I'll close there. I hope that you have an incredible rest of the um, conference and I've got some references on the next panel and I'll let you have a moment with that. Thank you so much, everyone. Be well. Thanks, Seki. I know, I know she's not here, but she might listen to the recording, so I feel like it's really important we give Fasana some round of applause. Um, And yeah, and it just felt so important. We had Becca Bunce on one of the earlier um, panels talking a little bit about disability justice, but that feels such an important lens to kind of centre in this work and a practice to continue to pay attention to. Um, so we have our last speaker, um, and we're going to then all have to run into the other room. Um, Renata, do you want to come up here? Are you going to stay there? Yeah, okay. Do you mind if I stay here? No, okay. no, I need to sit here. Do you, ha do you want oh, me to my, sit there? No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, the survivors. <laughs> I know it's been a long day, so I'll try to be quick and light as much as I can. Uh, so I'm part of the Earth, and I'm going to start sharing a bit uh, of my story, very personal. <sighs> Never told this to anyone before. <laughs> Not to this amount of people. <laughs> some nice quotes there just to give the tone uh, of what I want to share here with, with you. But basically, well, I'm from Brazil and I've been a social entrepreneur there for over 10 years. I was working with community development, very passionate about my work. I don't know who was here in the panel earlier saying that whole list of things funders expect us to do. So I was like giggling a lot because I went through a lot of that. And that I went through the burnout and the whole package and I got to the saying that I was swallowed by my own purpose. And then I was like, I can't do this anymore, not like this. Even though this is very purposeful to other communities, other people's life, it's ruining my own life, my own health. So um, I decided to go to a course internationally. I went to Schumacher College, some of you might be familiar with. I got a scholarship for this fellowship I was part of. And there I met my husband, who's actually speaking on the other room <laughs> at this moment. Uh, so first lesson, I'm really grateful for my burnout because that really changed my life. And I think when once we're in it, it's really hard to appreciate and learn what's coming out of it. But then when we look backwards, sometimes we can take positive things from that. But then also, uh, by the end of 2018, I left the country. And I was really lost because since until then, I was my work. You know, I was like really defined, I was really living my purpose and I was really passionate and any time I would introduce myself, I introduced my project. And then when I was there, I wasn't working on the ground, I didn't have the communities, I used to do like hands-on building projects, I couldn't say that how cool I do that and I was totally lost, like who am I without my work? I literally had to get to know myself again. Um, and then, in that same trip, I was in Australia, and two different people gifted me kind of spiritual readings, which I always liked a bit of it, but I wasn't like, okay, they're saying something really meaningful to my life. And both readings said I was going to work with women, and I had a role to play with women. I'm like, eh, okay, go on then, like whatever that means, just keep living life. And on the same week, I met this lady who was teaching how to hold women's circles. I'm like, okay, <laughs> there's something here, so I might enroll in this course, see what comes out of it. And then from that experience, I like felt a lot resonated because I used to facilitate a lot of space, so I found out like new tools, new ways of doing it. And I'm like, okay, I know there's something there. I can hear the signs, but I also 
I love my activism and I like to keep being in service and it doesn't mean there's no activism in just like holding normal women's circles, but I felt it was something other than that. And then similarly to you, I'm very inspired by nature. So most of our ideas within Be The Earth, our foundation, comes from hikes that my husband and I take. Our team, when I tell them, we went for a hike and they're like, oh my God, what's coming now? So what came out when one of those hikes was Aura, this program I'm gonna tell you a little bit about, that was this program that was focused on women and a bit of a disaccelerator because also as a social entrepreneur, I was part of all these fellowships, accelerating, accelerating programs. I was like, okay, but I'm already doing so much. How can I do more and be more and grow more? Can't fit this anymore in me. So I think I took my very personal experience and wanted to uh, be able to share that and also to hold this space that is like, it's okay to pause, it's okay to be a little lost, it's okay to, I don't know, the feeling is not okay and all that. And then when we started creating this program with a dear friend of ours, Eve Anik, um, I also got pregnant and that brought me and my womanhood to a whole other level. I think some of you who have kids in the audience probably know what I'm talking about, like just the whole experience of pregnancy. And then we were running our pilot fellowship at that same time. And then, so I was like breastfeeding while on the Zoom call and all that. And that, that was also really meaningful to me because I never seen anyone doing that before. And I'm like, but how do these mothers do? Do they just like shut up, shut off their lives for a few months? And I found out, yes, that's usually what happens. And I thought that wasn't that fun because being in those places actually made me a better mom and really fulfilled me as a human, as an individual and as a woman to be able to serve my family and the wider community that I like serving. So this is a picture of our global gathering last year. So actually pretty much all of our programs at Bid the Earth are focused on individuals, on women, mostly activists. And last year we did our first global gathering that put together all these women with this amazing high technological tool that is women's circles and deep listening and just being with each other and just, yeah, um, learning from each other, feeling they, their stories value something, getting to meet peers that went through similar things, also just co-creating how the programs could evolve. So it was a very un informal, uh, space and actually if we had if I had more than 10 minutes I would ask you like to get up and move your body a bit because I've been sitting and on our heads all day so part of this gatherings and how we run things at Bid Earth is also try to balance a bit more the like the heady things and body work and creative work so during these programs we always do well-being sessions that go from like I don't know stretching breath work to sewing together cacao ceremony uh, planting a seed on a pot while we're like all connected. So it's like bringing all this other skills and intelligence on our bodies. Uh, James mentioned about that uh, earlier, how the non-humans have so much intelligence. And I think what I found out in this whole journey is how the feminine has so much intelligence. Because as a woman, I was running this business, doing all things, but driven with a very masculine energy. And then I realized, wow, there's this whole other part of my body that is not just my brain that holds so much intelligence, all this intuition, all this kind of, you know, we get goosebumps when you hear something, and that says something. And we usually train to ignore that, you know, go to a meeting, say, let's leave the emotions out of the room, <laughs> which is like crazy, a little crazy. But anyway, um, so just going very quickly, what is different about Aura in terms of how we hold space? It's mainly uh, because we bring in nature. So we're, all the meetings are guided by the moon cycles. All the themes are guided by the seasons. We, we encourage the intuition. We give time. We pause. We rest. We sing. We laugh. We cry. So I think it's a bit less structure, which is uh, this masculine energy, which is very useful. I'm not saying it's wrong or bad, but it's not the only way of doing things, right? And as she said, you can, we can share the slides later, so I'm not going to waste much time here. But I think very quickly what Aura is, it's this uh, 
offer to the world that happens in different formats. So we've done two fellowships that are mostly for activists and we support them holistically with money, well-being, capacity building, community building, and all that. We also are now running our pilot of our uh, training for them to become facilitators with this methodology. And we've done a pocket retreat, what we call like a very short uh, experience. Some in this room have been there with us and it was amazing. Four women in leadership position that are holding space for everyone and everything and beyond. And then just to have the like two hours for lunch. And that's already enough, you know. So uh, yeah, I think what our dream is for our next steps with Aura is to create a community fund, so a fund that is led by women, so that they are the ones deciding who should get how much and why, if it's for projects, if it's for personal reasons, whatever that is, and that's still a dream. I'm an architect, I don't have any financial back background, so if you wanna uh, come join us on this dream and adventure, you'll be very welcome. And yeah, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Um, that was the hard slot to do. Um, you, do you want me to just say it? Because I, yeah, I think rather than you and come on, um, we just literally need to run because Vanessa has actually already just started in the other room. So sorry about that. Um, thank you. Thanks. It's like a. <laughs>